And now, more dates to put into your calendar. Mind the product in Singapore, uh, which is as close as it gets in March. Um, and, uh, and so tickets obviously still available. And uh, we have two fantastic speakers here tonight to give you a little bit of a taster. Um, both, uh, both internationals, as, uh, as I like to say. Uh, so we've got Martin Erickson, the founder of uh, Mind the Product and, uh, and Product Tank, um, who obviously runs the thing. Yes, yes. And, uh, and then we've got Barry, uh, the uh, author of Unlearn and, uh, and doer of a whole lot of other awesome things. I'll let him introduce. And he, yeah. Um, he did the keynote at Mind the Product um, a while ago. So, um, so you're in for a treat. Um, and we're going to record and stream the whole thing as well, which is a new feature that we have just rolled out and launched at Product Tank Sydney. Um, all right. Now, We've got a couple of people to thank for that. Uh, first of all, Optimizely, um, who are... Uh, has anyone heard of Optimizely? Quick show of hands. Let's keep the thing going. Great. Okay. So, um, so an optimization and experimentation platform um, that is um, uh, that that actually has a, a free version now um, for uh, sort of feature rollouts and um, and stage releases. Um, so pretty cool stuff. And the guys were kind enough to uh, to sponsor us with some video kits and um, and Josh over there who is uh, taking care of the cameras and the audio video uh, and all the stuff that I wouldn't understand how to do. Um, and uh, go and check them out. Now, we also have to thank Atlassian for being such generous hosts with uh, giving us this amazing venue and drinks and food um, and, uh, and a great product that we have uh, can use, love to use every single day. Um, and uh, I'd like to invite, sorry, I made this really awkward now, didn't I? Yes, uh, you did. Well, I'm German, it happens. Anyway, I'd like to invite uh, Nguyen up to, uh, to say a few words. Thank you. I'll keep this nice and short. Uh, so I was talking to Ben about what I should talk about, and he said, usually at things like this, they've said, oh, you know, put your hands up if you know the company. So if you've heard of it last year, put your hands up. <laughs> okay, that's most of you, so that's a good sign. Uh, so Ben reached out uh, through Sharif, and we got um, Sharif Mansour. You might know him as our distinguished product manager here. And we got talking, and it's really fantastic to see everybody here and to have such a strong and vibrant PM community here. I think that's really important to everyone here at Atlassian. We're here on a mission to unleash the potential of every team, not just through our software, but also through our people and our practices and the way that we work. And so if, can I get, you know, he's stolen my show of hands thing. So if you're an Atlassian, can I get you to put your hand up again, please? So we'd love to chat to you about how we work here. And if you're in recruiting, can you just wave your hands? Like, as, part of that, um, as part of our mission, we are hiring like crazy across all of our disciplines, PM, engineering, and design. So you know, from entry levels to senior executives and so on. So if you do have an interest in what it's like to work here at Atlassian, or if you're interested in talking about so what roles and opportunities we might have, please see our fantastic recruitment team down the back at the end of today's presentations. A quick logistics note as well, we have one bathroom just over here, but that's not the only one that we have. If you keep following past the blue bollards and keep snaking around the building, there are another set of bathrooms for you to all to use. Our, our friendly security guard who is floating around somewhere will make sure that you find a way. You're not here to hear from me, you're here to hear from the others, so without further ado, over to Martin. Break for AV connections. Always the fun part of speaking. Let's see if I can figure out which is the HDMI cable. It seems to be working here, but not over there. Always the way. Sorry. Oh, I need to push a button. You need to push a button? Yes. Uh, sorry, I forgot about that. Every time you change the laptop. Got it. Hey! And that's why organizing meetups is such a difficult job. Thank you, Ben, uh, and thank you, Atlassian, for hosting us. Thank you, all of you, for coming. 
Uh, as Ben mentioned, I founded Product Tank back in London in 2010. I was a VP product at a startup, and that can be a pretty lonely job for any of you who are working on a smaller team. All the engineers are ganging up on you, all the designers are making fun of you. So I decided I need to build a meetup to just to meet other product people and be able to talk about this craft of ours and figure out how to do it better, uh, and just so we could learn from each other. And that very first meetup, we were 20 people in the back room of a pub, um, and that's kind of all we wanted it to be. I think it had it stayed that way and met up every couple months, that would have been perfectly fine. But it's kind of taken on a life of its own. Uh, and as of this week, we're in 195 cities around the world, which is kind of insane. Uh, and it's a lot less lonely because of it. So thank you for that. And it's super exciting every time I get to come to a new city and uh, speak at a product tank and meet the community. The last time I was in Sydney was about 10 years ago, and product tank didn't even exist. So these things move fast. So a little bit more about me before I get into the talk. I've been doing product online for about 25 years. Started building stuff in the early 90s. Had the product title for 21 plus years, uh, both in corporates and startups. Like I said, found a product tank, which is now in 195 cities, and co-authored a book on product leadership for O'Reilly a few years ago. I'm also the co-founder of Mind a Product, which spun out of product tank. We run conferences in London, San Francisco, and now Singapore. But really, this obsession for me, like I said, started at this startup that I worked at in London in 2010 called Huddle. And this was the, the extent of the team at the time, which you can understand why I thought I was a little bit alone as the only product person in the organization. And we started experimenting with kind of new ways of working and new ways of building teams and setting up goals and trying to figure out how to build better product. And ever since, I've been trying to figure out what it is that makes a team look like this, nice and happy, and not like this. <laughs> And for us, it really starts about thinking back to first principles and really understanding what product management is. As Marty Kagan said, who's probably the godfather of modern product management, the role of a product manager is to discover a product that is valuable, usable, and feasible. Some of you may recognize this Venn diagram, which I drew in 2011, that explores in a similar vein product's role at the intersection of the customer, the technology, and the business. And the challenge with that is a lot of people think that every product person has to look like this. We have to be these perfect individuals that have all the skills in tech. We can go write code. We're great designers and can do pixel perfect designs, wireframes, whatever we need to do. And we understand the business side and can build a business plan and understand cost modeling and things like that. When of course, it's just not true. Most of us look like this, like this, or like this. And it's only once we bring together a team that we actually bring all those skills together. And in fact, today, there's probably a dozen more overlapping circles, from data science to marketing, that we need in our teams in order to actually build products people love. So the first step to building a successful team is to assemble your team. Like any good heist movie, we have to go find the right team. We have to go find our demolitions expert. We have to go find our driver. We have to find the electronics guru who can turn off the alarm. And a great model to start thinking about that is to start drawing out what your team actually looks like. And it's not just about those three axes of customer, business, and technology. It might be work experience, industry knowledge, creativity, culture, or life experience. Whatever it is for your team, what you and your team needs, Think about mapping it out in a spider chart. And then you can start mapping out individuals on that team. What are they bringing to the table? What are their unique experiences and skill sets that they're bringing to the team? And you can start identifying where you have overlaps and where you have gaps. The reason this is so important is research after research after research shows that diverse teams are simply better at solving problems. Decades of research by organizational scientists, psychologists, sociologists, economists, demographers show that socially diverse teams are more innovative than homogenous groups. And in product, that's even more important than ever because it's only by bringing together the opportunity space provided by the customer with the problem space that the product team can bring to bear that you find empathy for the customer. And simply interacting with individuals who are different than you mean that you are more likely to be able to find those alternative viewpoints and to empathize with your customer. 
And if that's not enough, even McKinsey has gotten in on the act. So you know, like, we have to start taking this seriously now, guys and gals. Diverse companies are 35% more likely to outperform their competition. And this wasn't a small sample set. This was a study of over 1,000 companies over 15 years of life cycle. And it showed that the companies that are in the top quartile for diversity were 35% more likely to outperform their competition in profitability and value creation. That's a meaningful impact. It's also important because product is a team sport. We get a lot of debates about who owns the product, who owns the customer, who owns the data, and I really just don't care. Because <laughs> we all own the product. We're all responsible for the outcome. We're all responsible for the customer together. As Marty Kagan said, again, if you're only using your engineers to code, you're only getting half their value. And I would argue that that's true for everyone else. If you're only using your designers to push pixels around, you're only getting half their value. If you're only using product managers to prioritize your JIRA backlog, you're only getting half their value. It's only by all of us coming together and bringing all of our skills and experience to bear that we can build great products. So it's really starting to think about cross-functional teams and how we can bring those together. I mixed up my slides, and here's a problem opportunity space slide I meant to mention. <laughs> where bringing together, got you confused on the last one, didn't I? Uh, where engineering and design can bring an understanding of the solution space, product management, user research, data can bring an understanding of the problem space, and we find that intersection. But as we all know, as soon as you have more than one team, we also get friction. And this is why we have book after book, methodology after methodology about project management, prioritization, dependency management, inboxes and outboxes. It's all to manage friction. And when I mean cross-functional, I want to urge you to figure out how to stop that friction from happening. The only way to do that is to really think about all the skills the team needs. My favorite example of this is a startup in London called TransferWise. How many of you have heard of TransferWise? Do international currency transfers? So they take this really to the extreme. And my favorite example is a team called the Currencies Team. They're responsible for launching new currency paths, like pounds to Australian dollars. And they realize that in any traditional organization, they would have to go to a banking department and ask for help to open the bank accounts in the target country. They'd then have to wait six months for that to be a priority for the banking department. Then they'd have to go to the legal department and ask to update the terms of service. And about six months later, that would be a priority for the legal team. And it takes a year to even get this thing started. So they said, well, the F word that's on the screen there, uh, and decided to figure out a better way to do it and simply embedded lawyers and embedded bankers in the team. So they have designers, they have engineers, they have a product manager, they have a data scientist, and they have two lawyers and two bankers. So they don't have any dependencies. There is no friction with other teams. They have everything they need to do in that team. Contrast that with someone else I met recently who's an amazing data scientist, worked at a Fortune 50 company in the US, and proudly pronounced that they worked for the Research and Insight Division. Think about that for a moment. An entire division responsible for research and insights. On the one hand, account kind of sounds amazing, right? We have a whole division of amazing resources to go do fundamental research, do all the surveys, the ethnographic studies, all the things that we want, make sure that it's statistically viable, everything. It sounds amazing. But then imagine the friction of actually getting that team to do any work for you. Imagine having to leap over layers and layers of organizational bureaucracy to actually get a, a piece of research done. Imagine having to write a business case in order to get the research you need for a business case. <laughs> so once we've got a team up and running, we've figured out who we need on it, we've made it as diverse as we can, and we've made it as cross-functional as it needs to be, the second big step is to work on trust and motivation. And it's important to really think about what it is that makes a team successful. How many of you have heard of Project Aristotle at Google? About eight or 10 hands. It's also known as Project Rework. 
Uh, and it was this fantastic research that Google did over two or three years, looking at, I think, 200 teams in a couple of different offices to try and understand what it is that made their team successful, what made for a great product team or engineering team. And being Google, of course, they went in thinking that, you know, the more Stanford PhDs we have in a team, the better it's going to be, right? But they found that those classical measures of intelligence, success, the kind of complicated interview questions that they used to ask people had no correlation whatsoever with the team's success. Instead, they found five factors that really affected team performance. And the number one by far was this concept of psychological safety, which I'm sure you've heard of at this point. Dependability, structure and clarity, meaning and impact are all important. I'll cover a few of those. But psychological safety means that a team is more likely to admit mistakes, take on new roles and challenges, harness new diverse ideas, and challenge the status quo. And I think we'll all agree that these are ingredients we would like in our teams. Now, I know this might be controversial, but the other example I like to use is the world's leading sports franchise, the All Blacks. <laughs> Sorry. Who uh, do have a rule in their team guide that comes from their coach that says no dickheads. Pretty simple rule. Doesn't matter how brilliant you are as an individual performer, if you can't play with the team, you're not allowed on the All Blacks. So what makes a team motivated? Again, I love diving into research, so if you haven't read Daniel Pink's book, Drive, The Surprising Truth About What Motivates Us, I highly recommend it, where he looks at a bunch of research that came out of MIT, looking at, again, hundreds of people in kind of modern thought uh, leadership roles to really understand what it was that motivated them. And what the research showed makes innate sense. It's that the kind of old model of a carrot and stick doesn't work anymore. Once you get to a certain point of paying market salaries and rewarding people for the work they do, adding more financial rewards don't improve performance. They just don't. Instead, he found three factors that do. Autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Autonomy is our desire to be self-directed and it increases engagement over compliance. Mastery is our urge to get better skills and master our craft, which is hopefully why you're all here today, other than the free beer. And purpose is our desire to do something that has meaning and is important. All things, hopefully, that you find in your work. At the same time, it's worth thinking about what the best way to lead is. And again, the research showed that there's broadly three categories of leadership. There's authoritative, where the leader's there to set clear expectations. The leader makes all the decisions with little or no input from the team. It's very task-driven. And it works well when labor is low-skilled and the leader has all the knowledge and experience. As you can understand, even from the language, labor, we're basically talking about a factory floor here. We're talking about 18th century best practices. I really hope your teams aren't working like this. There's participative leadership, where the leader's there to give hands-on guidance, gets input from the team, but makes the final decision. It's very collaborative. It's kind of modern management thinking, where workers have some knowledge, but you want to retain decision-making at the top. You kind of don't fully trust your team. And finally, there's delegative leadership, where you give high-level guidance, but you give autonomy to make decisions to the team. It's very people-driven, works very well for creative jobs and knowledge workers. And really, that sweet spot is about thinking about how to motivate people by giving them autonomy and get the best performance out of them by, giving, by delegating that leadership. Autonomy simply motivates better, it scales better, and it, is more, it makes sure that you stay quick and nimble. It also works because, let's be honest, your team is smarter than you are. At least I know mine is. They're definitely closer to the customer than you are, and they have more information than you do. So why are you telling them what to do? If in doubt, go ask what a general thinks. George Patton, the famous World War II general, said that if you tell people where to go but not how to get there, you'll be amazed at the results. Now, a lot of people hear autonomy and they think anarchy. If anyone can do whatever they want, how are we ever going to build a business? How are we going to move this forward together? They can come and go as they please. 
And really the key is to do, to build autonomy with alignment. This is a two by two by Henrik Nieberg, who was the organizational coach behind Spotify. He's also worked at Lego and now Muyang, the company behind Minecraft, that maps out alignment versus autonomy. If you start on the bottom left with low alignment and low autonomy, you have a micromanaging organization and an indifferent culture. If you instead move up the alignment scale, you have a very authoritative organization where the pointy-haired boss tells you everything you need to do, gives you your task list, and everyone just conforms. If you instead move up the autonomy scale, you have an entrepreneurial organization where you kind of hope somebody is actually working on the problem, but everyone is running in different directions. This is probably most startups out there, at least most of the ones that I meet. And for the consultants in the room, you know you always want to be in the top right corner on a two by two. <laughs> high alignment and high autonomy means that you have an innovative organization and a collaborative culture where leadership is still critical to give that vision, uh, to clarify what the problem and the objective is, but it's up to the team to figure out how to get there. So the key to successful autonomy is to do it with accountability. And part of that comes from how we set goals. So in a traditional organization, you'll start at the top with the company goals. The company then goes and tells each team, this is what you need to contribute to hit our goals. The team goes and tells each individual, this is what you need to do in order for us to hit our goals. And you get to the end of the quarter, whatever your planning period is, and you realize you've missed all your goals because you overcommitted or overpressured people. In an autonomous organization, it still starts with a vision and a company goal. But again, it's the key is to step back and let the team figure out how they can help the company achieve the goals. And let each team go off and figure out what it is that they can contribute to and what they can commit back as goals before that planning period even starts. And the beauty is you pretty quickly see if you have a gap or not. In this example, maybe team B needs a bit more help. Maybe you need to spin up a new business area. Maybe you need to readjust your expectations for the quarter. But at least you know in advance. So we've set up our team, we've given them some autonomy, some accountability, some motivation. The last step in a great product team is to make sure that we're always focused on the problem. Theodore Levitt has a famous quote that's used a lot in marketing, that people don't want a quarter inch drill, they want a quarter inch hole. If you ever did a marketing course in university, I hope you heard that. But as product managers, I really want to exhort you to dig deeper. Why do they want a quarter inch drill? Okay, so they want a quarter inch hole. Why do they want a hole? Oh, they're trying to run a cable through the wall. Why are they trying to do that? Oh, they want music in the bedroom. Okay, well that's the problem we're trying to solve, right? And given technology today, there might be a million different options than drilling a hole in the wall. Especially not recommended if you're a tenant. <laughs> Maybe we just need to buy them a Sona speaker or a Bluetooth speaker. By really digging to the bottom of the problem, you understand what the solution is. As Ken Norton, who's a product partner at Google Ventures said, once you understand the problem at a deep level, success is actually really easy to articulate because you know what it's like when the problem is solved. Now it's a very simplistic example, but with the music in the bedroom, you know you solve the problem if you hear music in the bedroom. It kind of doesn't matter how the team made that happen. If there is a hole in the wall, if there's a Sonos speaker, whatever, the problem's solved, the customer's happy. So fall in love with the problem because solutions change, but problems don't. If you really dig down into human motivation, a lot of our fundamental needs haven't actually changed. Our tastes might have. We now prefer nice houses over caves, but it's still a need for shelter. It's still the same fundamental problem that we're trying to solve. The other beauty of falling in love with the problem is that it kind of makes you have to practice continuous discovery. As Peter Drucker, who's probably one of my, famous, my favorite business authors, said, there's nothing quite so useless as doing with great efficiency that which should not be done at all. And I think especially in the tech industry, we have kind of fallen into this trap. We've kind of obsessed about delivery, and we have all these methodologies from Prince to Kanban to Waterfall to Agile that obsess about how we deliver more, faster, cheaper. And we kind of forget that they all come from the Toyota production system. They all come from a factory floor. And we kind of forget that the designers at that factory don't work that way, because they can't work that way. 
the discovery process, designing a car, is a very different process than Kanban. And as product managers, I'm ashamed to say that we've forgotten that there's a lot of methodologies that actually do that for us as well. The UX designers in the room are hopefully nodding along and going, yes. The other thing we've forgotten is that there isn't actually a line between these two things. It's a constant connection. It's a constant loop. We're always, should always be out talking to our customers, understanding what the problem is, figuring out different ways to do that discovery, and then picking whatever tool works best for our team and our market to deliver that. Because discovery is about building the right thing, and delivery is about building the thing right. So beware the dogma that you hear from anyone who's read a book and says, we have to apply this exactly the way the author wrote. It just doesn't work. Even the Agile Manifesto itself says that we value responding to change over following a plan. So embrace change. Figure out what works for you and your team. It might be, it might be Scrum, it might be Kanban, it might be Scrum Band. The teams that I run, I kind of don't care. It's up to the team to figure out what works for them and what they're happy with. And as long as they're learning and as long as they're running retrospectives to figure out what works for them, that's all we need. So to wrap up, product management isn't actually about product, it's about people. As John Maida said, don't forget that people make the stuff, but relationships make the bigger stuff. So get the relationships and people right first, and everything else will follow. To recap the whole talk, start with assembling your team, thinking about how to make it as diverse, cross-functional, and ideally, in my world, co-located as possible. Set them up for success by thinking about psychological safety, giving them autonomy, and showing them the purpose. And then make sure that they're focused on the problem by balancing discovery versus delivery. Or to give you the real cliff note, hire smart people who work well together, get the hell out of the way, and focus on goals, not on how you get there. Now, I feel like a lot of people, when I do this talk, the next question is usually, great, now what? What am I supposed to do? How can I make this happen? I'm not the product leader, I'm not the CPO, I'm not the CEO. How can I make this organization change in my company? As Barry is fond of saying, think big and start small. This is a utopian ideal. There are not many teams that do all of the things that I just talked about. But start thinking about how you can move one step closer to that. On the team side, think about who's in the room. If you're having a discussion about a product feature, is design there with you? Is engineering with you? Is someone from marketing, sales? Is a customer in the room? How can you make that viewpoint as diverse as possible? Ask yourself and your team, do you know what your vision are, is, what your mission is, what your company objectives are, and how you're helping achieve those? And finally, if you want to focus on the problem, do you know what the problem is you're solving? And if it's add feature X, that's not a customer problem, that's a business problem. Thank you very much. Ben, do you want to Q&A now, or do you want to yes. do it together? Yeah. Yeah. Apparently, we didn't buy you enough beer. Need some more Dutch courage. Can I ask you a really big question? Yep. OK, so uh, with, I guess, last, I'm just doing retrospective on the 2010s. And uh, things have kind of gone a bit sour after GFC. So as a result of the GFC, I guess uh, the US kind of taste for going out of wars and kind of being depleted, and so the US has kind of had this fatigue of not wanting to do as much around the world. And that's kind of helped um, the people that like to create division and um, create conflict within um, democracies. So. Um, how would, you do, how would you treat democracy as a product? Um, I think we can about this, but um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to, to figure out what is the most populist um, product for democracy. Well, starting with the easy questions. Um, 
I, I, I mean, I think that one's obviously ridiculously hard to solve, or we would have solved it already. I think the, the fundamental problem for me is how do we give voice to our populations without letting them get swayed by simplistic arguments, probably. Um, there's probably better ways to phrase that. So I think, I think it's, it's a war on multiple fronts. I think a lot of the conversation happening right now around Facebook and Twitter and political ads. Um, I live in London, so we're going through our third general election in four years because nobody actually wants to have another referendum on Brexit. Is that the right way to do democracy? Probably not. Um, so I, I, I think it's just one of those things where there's not going to be an easy answer. And I think what it has really shown us in the tech industry is just how much impact we actually have on the world and how we need to think about that. So at Mind of Products, we do talk a lot about ethics. And uh, every conference, we have a couple of speakers to come talk about it because I, I, I feel like it's something we need to talk more about as an industry and be more open about our impact and understand what can happen. And not all of us work at Facebook that have these global level impacts, but any, any tool can be used um, badly if someone wants to enough. Uh, and it's kind of on us as the product managers to really own that and think that through before we put something out there into the world. Um, so slightly depressing end of the answer, but I don't, think there, I don't think there's an easy answer to that one. I'd love to talk more about it over a beer afterwards. But uh, I think if, if the only thing we can take away from that is as product people, if we can feel more responsible for what we put out in the world, I think that's a good thing. We're going to get more questions on democracy. <laughs> Thank you for an amazing talk. And uh, referring to your slide, where you show the, uh, co the vision, the uh, company goals, team goals, individual goals, and so on, and especially if you go back to the startup model or the simplistic, where the company is still not really huge enough, how do you balance the need for visions and directions we buy in from the rest of the company to that level. I can see a few arrows and see that I can see that I see friction seen when the arrows point one way and the other ones point the other way. Funnily enough I have a whole other talk on this subject. Um, and if anyone's in Auckland on Thursday I'll be giving it there. But um, <laughs> you're absolutely right in that it isn't I think that transition from kind of a traditionally top-down organization where the vision, everything came from the top and you just push down the tasks that had to be done to achieve that makes this a much more collaborative process. This is, as with any talk, a very simplified slide to show the concept. Um, basically, what I believe is that you still need all those elements. You need a really clear vision and mission, the purpose for the company, what you're trying to do. You need a very good and well-articulated strategy of how are you going to achieve that mission or vision, what are the kind of unique strengths that your company has, what are the opportunities in the marketplace, et cetera. And then you break that further down into kind of goals and objectives, thinking about OKRs um, as a method. Uh, and this is definitely not something that kind of goes from top down or bottom up. It's kind of a, it's a, it's a sliding scale, if you will. Like the vision mission piece is probably set more or less by leadership in a startup. It's usually the founder's job but hopefully they're doing it in consultation and conversation with the rest of the team. And then it's a sliding scale from that kind of 80% founders, 20% team to kind of actually 100% team and 0% founders at the kind of implementation level of what you're writing. But everything in between is, is definitely a conversation and needs to be something that is a, a shared undertaking because clarity of that communication is so key for any of this to work that if you kind of just hand it down from on high, it's never going to be understood by the rest of the team. So it really has to be something that everyone's bought into and understands why the company has chosen to make those decisions. So you're right, this is a simplified version of that. Um, but I think it is thinking about that sliding scale of how much do you involve the, the whole team um, from that top to bottom. Hopefully that helps. I think we had more. So the question was if there are any, I'll repeat the question for this one. Um, and we can take another one after that. So the question here was if there are any books particularly on this area. Um, so ironically, I might be writing one soon because um, I haven't really found one that covers the whole thing. I think the, there are a lot of books on different elements. So there's a lot of good books around strategy. One of my favorites is Good Strategy, Bad Strategy. Uh, one of my favorites around kind of the alignment autonomy piece. 
is turn the ship around, which is actually about a naval officer and a submarine. Uh, I have more examples I can share later, but I think there's a lot of good books about the different elements, but not enough people have talked about the importance of bringing it all together into one cohesive whole. Uh, if anyone knows of that, please let me know, and I can not waste the next six months writing a book. Um, but I think that's one of the challenges is that in kind of industry, we get stuck on these fads and we get excited about a shiny new thing. And so in the 90s, we talked a lot about strategy and you know there were a lot of MBAs running companies. So it was very natural to kind of dive into that conversation. And then we kind of got a bit more dreamy about what the internet could be in the noughties and we talked much more about vision and mission and we kind of forgot about strategy because it's hard. Um, and I think the key is really to make sure that we have every step in that way uh, in that kind of stack or, uh, or it's not going to be successful basically. So I, I haven't found yet a book that covers the whole thing, but I think there are good ones for covering each step. Uh, you're absolutely right. And like cult culturally, this is very challenging. Um, obviously, been doing quite a lot of talks around Southeast Asia recently, and it's especially difficult there, where you have different power structures and different kind of implied um, pieces like that. But regardless of whether it's a cultural challenge or kind of a, an organizational challenge, I think the, it's the same advice. It's basically start small. It's find the small decisions and let the team take those. And the more and more they, they can take on ownership, though gain confidence and earn the trust of the company at the same time to make bigger and bigger decisions. So as with all of these things, it's not kind of just going into the room tomorrow and being like, right, yesterday I told you what stories to write, now you're all going to decide yourselves and then walking out of the room, right? Like it's, it's definitely a process. It takes time to build that trust with the company, but it also takes time to build that confidence and trust in the team that they're going to get it wrong sometimes and that's okay too as long as we learn from it. So it, it really is starting small um, and it could even just be you know, if you're working in sprints, as an example, pick one story in your next sprint that you ha you state much more loosely as a problem statement. Let the team help figure out how to solve that. Like that could be how you start and build it up slowly that, from there. Because you're right, you can't just flick that switch, and it has to be a a learned behavior and an earned trust. I think as much as anything. So hope that helps. Should we do one more question and introduce the Irishman? Any more questions? One way at the back. Uh, continuing on the topic of autonomy, um, obviously in larger organisations we have multiple levels. Um, middle layers obviously try and encourage autonomy in teams. What are the top tips for um, trying to stop executive level people constantly intervening and undermining that autonomy that you're trying to instill? I think there, there's a couple of techniques that I use specifically for that, which um, I think you're hitting on one of the biggest challenges to this is you kind of need executive buy-in. And, and again, to the earlier point, you kind of need to earn that to some extent. It's, again, not something they're going to give overnight. But for me, it's always come down to making it less about opinions, right? You've probably all heard about the hippo, right? The highest paid person's opinion kind of storming around the room and breaking everything. The only defense against that is evidence, right? So the more that you can bring data to bear, the more you can bring you know, insights from your customers, videos from your latest testing to show why your idea is better, their idea isn't working. Obviously, again, face saving and the cultural things like that come into it, so you're not telling them they're idiots to their face necessarily. Um, but thinking about how, how can you bring that evidence to bear and how can you make that the culture in the company so that it is more about evidence, more about data, more about customer insight, because then the team's going to win 90% of the time anyway because they are closer to the customer. They have that data to hand. They're the ones hopefully out talking to the customer every week, um, and they're going to be able to settle those arguments. Now, there are going to be big bet things that you have to get into as a company where you like, we are in making an intuitive leap based on loose data that strategically we need to make this big bet. 
and that's where it can be really interesting to actually change language and start talking about bets, right? It's not, this is a strategy, we're going to go do this thing. The strategy is we're going to make a bet on this. And there's a safety in that language, both for the executive to be wrong, um, but that, you're out, that you are making a bet. There's something you're going to test, you can measure it, you're going to figure out what those key results are to know whether you've achieved it or not, so you can de-risk it. So those are two, two things that I quite like to use. Fundamentally, it comes down to making it about data and not about opinion. Hope that helps. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. We're going to hand over to Barry O'Reilly. Ben, you need to come push the button again, I think. Button pusher. At least that was my job. There we go. Push button deployments, they're pretty good as well, aren't they? <laughs> so um, it's, I've been asked to come and speak about product portfolios. And this is really an interesting topic for me. I'm sure there's uh, people in the room, some people might be chief product officers. Some people might want to be a chief product officer in their future. Think about that deeply. <laughs> Maybe you're just a product manager. You're starting to learn your skills. And you're starting to think about, well, how is this talk going to matter for me? You know, I, I want you to think about these in terms of scope. When I'm working with senior executives who are leading these companies and looking at whole portfolios of companies and all the products and services that are in them, it's about helping them develop strategies for the different type of domains that they're operating in. So if you're a product manager and you're just looking after one product, maybe think about you know, the different features of your product, the portfolio of the product that you're working in. Maybe you're just someone who's interested in trying to improve the processes that you're working on in your company. New emerging processes you're trying to bring in, some you're trying to sunset. All right, so think of these stories I'm going to share and strategies I'm going to show you and tools I'm going to show you as you can plug them in, whether you're a product manager, thinking about the features of your work, or processes you want to change, scaling it right up to if you're the chief product officer of a Fortune 500 company and you're trying to think about how you might manage your whole portfolio of products. Sound all right? Great. So the most important question uh, I'm going to take you through are understanding how well you know how your portfolio operates. So first question for everybody in the room. Who knows the strategic objectives of their organization? Okay, who wants to shout some of theirs out? A billion dollar portfolio by 2020. Billion dollar portfolio by 2020. Awesome. What else? Right? This is the first thing. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Great. Become known for being the best candidate at clients. clients in the industry. Awesome. Brilliant. Okay. This is my first challenge to you folks. You need to actually start on learning this stuff. When people start asking you this question, the answer shouldn't be, uh, you should be listing this stuff off at the top of your tongue. You should know exactly, quantifiably, what your company, what your portfolio is trying to achieve. Now, normally when I go into most organizations and I ask this question, what's the strategic objective or mission of the company, this is pretty much what I hear. Guided mission to be relentlessly focused on quality. Oh, shit, you've called it quality already. Hang on. Oh, wait, we've nowhere the buttons to fill in here. It's basically blah, 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 blah. Number one in our market, billion dollars, best in the industry. Everybody gets super motivated by that, right? And you know exactly on your day-to-day -day how everything you do correlates to achieving that objective, right? Uh, you know, one of my favorite examples of this is uh, from Netflix. So Patty McCor's book, Powerful, it's recommended reading for everybody. It's a phenomenal book. She was the chief people officer for uh, Netflix, a uh, key contributor to the culture deck that Netflix is obviously famous for. And one of her sort of tests for the measure about how well the leadership team was functioning is she would walk down the corridors and she would stop people and she would ask them, 
what's the strategic objectives of the company? And if they, people couldn't list them off, one, two, three, four, five, just like bullets, and even better use the language that the leadership team had used to communicate it, it was a fail. But not a fail on the individual, a fail on the leadership team not to communicate the intent. So these are the kind of things I want you to start thinking about. If you're going to have a portfolio of work, it's got to roll up to contribute and impact something. And if you don't know what that problem is, you need to get on a plane, fly to New Zealand tomorrow, Martin's doing a talk on the decision stack, you should probably see that, it's going to be a great talk. Now the other thing I want you to start thinking about to be on, unlearned here is when I start to ask people, well what's in your portfolio? What's the portfolio of products that you're working on? Most people will list off a couple of projects they're working on, their favorite prep project, maybe their buddies on a project. But it's really a struggle for most companies to do. Uh, one of my favorite activities to start doing when I go into any organization is starting to understand all the moving components in that organization. And surprise, surprise, when you do it with leadership teams, nobody knows it all. The amount of projects that are going on in some companies, people don't even have a clue. This is me like pulling together a leadership team of a fairly well-known consultancy. You might recognize some characters in here. Like trying to get people to understand all the work that is happening in their organization is challenging. Nobody knows it all. How many projects do you think are operating in your current organization? Does anyone know? Does anyone want to guess? 20, great. What else? How, how many do you think Atlassian has operating? 480,000. 480,000, exactly, right? So this is some of the challenge. We're unclear about what we're actually trying to achieve in objective terms. We have a whole load of stuff that's happening, people busy doing stuff, but there's no way that we're holding ourselves accountable to understand what are we actually doing, what outcome do we expect it to achieve. So this is why mapping your portfolio is so important. Whether it's even just your product and its features or the processes you want to experiment with, right through to your whole company. Now, one of the tools I always use is this. So you can check out the blog post. There's a workbook that everybody can download and use. But I like to start thinking about portfolios in these different domains. Explore is about new products and services that you're building. Hypothesis you have about future growth for your organization, things that might work, things that could be beneficial in the future. Exploit are the products that you've tested, got some validation on, you're starting to think about how you scale those up into more robust products and services in your business. Sustain are the ones that have lived for a long time. They're well-known operating products and services that people understand or might drive a lot of your revenue. And then retire is the place that nobody ever knows. Has anyone ever retired a project? Congratulations. That's where we're thinking about here. Right, so congratulations, I've just promoted you all to Chief Product Officers of Global Corp. Welcome to the company, everybody. All your applications were so good, I just gave you all the job. I didn't know who to choose. Right, so I want you to think about your current company, the company that you're working in. And I, you've got $100 to invest. How much of your company, how much are they investing in each one of these domains? Of your $100, take a minute, describe it down. How much of your $100 is in Explore? How much of the $100 is in Exploit? Sustain and retire. I'll give you 30 seconds. Off you go. OK. Who wants to shout out what the ratios are for their company? 15, 10, 65. Great, right. So 15, 10, 65. Awesome. Great. What else? 10, 30, 60, 0. Nice. 10, 30, 60, 0. Awesome. Great. What else? Typically, when I do this, it sort of goes like this. Uh, explore, luckily, if you have 5%. Uh, exploit, people maybe sometimes say like 10 or 15%. Sustain is generally around 70 or 80 percent, and if you're lucky, you've maybe 5 percent uh, in retire. Right? That's where that's where most companies operate. If I ask people how many projects they've killed, most people will say zero, because every idea you have is awesome, right? 
So these are some of the challenges when you start to think about where people are investing their time and effort. When you think about the strategic objectives of your company, try to be a billion dollar organization, and you think about the numbers that you just wrote down about how you're making investments to get to those objectives. What are the ratios? Are they right? Are they wrong? What should they be? Just to give you an example with Netflix, so their business model is about creating constant new content, getting people to constantly watch. What, we, what do we think Netflix's key objectives are? What, what would be some of their key metrics they'd be looking at as an organization? <coughs> Increased viewing time. Awesome. What else? Subscribers. Subscribers. Thank you very much. More subscribers. Repeat usage. Re repeat usage. Right. Retention. So let's just say retention is a key metric for them. They want to see 20% increase in retention in the next six months. So what would you do if you were starting to invest? Where would you start to want to put that effort? They spend 90% of their budget in Explore because they're building new content all the time. They're building new technology to scale their business, to reach more people, to expand the network, to keep growing their business, to keep growing their audience. That's the investment ratio that makes sense for their business model. So what I want you to start having clarity and checking and balancing against is when you look at the objectives for your organization, looking at where you're investing in your portfolio, does it all marry up and make sense about what ratios you're putting into each one of these domains to drive the outcomes and the objectives that you're looking for? One of the sort of challenges, though, about getting to this world is you've got to flip into stop thinking about solutions and start getting to bets. So uh, when we were writing Lean Enterprise, it's always really important to have research in the industry about what people are doing. So we teamed up with Forrester because they're a reputable crew, and we were a couple of jokers writing a book. And we sent a, 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 um, a survey out to, how much is it? It's about 140 senior leadership teams about how they made investment decisions in organizations. Do you want to find out what the results were? I'm excited. Are you excited? Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's true. 47% of people say they decide by committee a.k.a. we make stuff up. 24% said that they have some financial modeling. It's pretty nice. Good for them. Martin just meant, mentioned 13% of people, the person with the highest salary wins out, affectionately known as the hippo. Product portfolio approach. Well, we needed to have five things, so we just made that up. <laughs> Apparently 9% of people do that. And then uh, no systemic approach, 7%. So what we learned from doing this exercise is that 7% of people tell the truth. <laughs> and 90... But it, it sort of gives you a sense about like, how are we making investments in our products and services? How are we holding ourselves accountable to what actually works? You know, and, and this is the way it works when you start to think about how traders operate in the market. If they have a $100 portfolio, they make lots of small bets. They just take $5 and make five bets in the market, see how that portfolio performs, and if it works, they double down on it, and if it doesn't, they just lose a dollar. This is the principle of optionality. This is how investors manage uncertainty. This is why when we talk about thinking big and starting small, making lots of small bets, testing, prototyping, you're trying to optimize to find out as quickly and cheaply as possible this is the product that you want to build. You see, depending on the lifestyle or stage of your product, where it's at, whether you're exploring a new product, starting to exploit it or sustain it, measures of success are different. At the start, you're paying for information. You're investing to find out if you should keep investing in this idea. The currency of innovation at the start is information. Should we keep investing in this product or not? But then as the thing starts to scale, your metrics change. You're looking at profitability. How can you start to scale the product more efficiently right through to profitability and sunsetting it over time? So this is really important uh, when you start to think about how you construct your teams and what you're doing in this space. In Explore, you should be making lots of small bets, like creating small teams to rapidly test new ideas or hypotheses you have to find out what works and what doesn't. If you've got big budgeting processes and it's really hard to get projects together or ideas off the ground tested, you're only going to make one or two bets a year. 
High performance organizations are making two, three, four, five hundred bets a year. Because guess what? Most of our ideas suck. They're going to be wrong. So the quicker and cheaper that you can get to that resolution, the better investments you're going to start making. Because the products that work, they're going to start to grow and scale. They're going to exploit. You're going to need to start thinking about different ways of managing them. Right through to things that are sustaining as the teams get bigger. You're involving more parties. But the problem is, in most products, is once a product starts working, we just keep loading, loading, loading features into it. Right? More features equals more value. Right? Wrong. Right? What you should be thinking about is what things can you kill off to reduce the complexity of your systems? What things can you spin out into new initiatives and try and throw them through the cycle again? How quickly can you kill things? The truth is, all business models and products are transient. It's only a matter of time until they'll be disrupted. So if you've only got one bet in your portfolio of keeping the business alive, that's fragile. That's where your organization is going to get in trouble. So the key to get there is this. You've got to start doing products and never do a project again. And this is one of the key parts for this audience as product project and product managers. We work in an information age. The people who can learn the quickest, the fastest, the cheapest, at the highest fidelity win. That's the game. Most people are trapped in what I affectionately call annual fuzzle water can, scrum continuous fall ban delivery ops. <laughs> so, okay, shake your head. If you're there, who has a friend who works in a company like this? But we've got agile teams, Barry. I'm like, awesome. How frequently do you ship your software? Once every six months? Right, and these are the sort of challenges, right? At the fuzzy front end, all the planning, the budgeting, getting your idea funded, getting people to quickly test it. If it takes you six months when you have an idea and you've got to fill in 400 page PowerPoint deck, do a presentation to your boss, to their boss, another tap dancing routine, maybe get it funded. Who wants to do that? You're investing all your money in printing paper rather than testing the idea. Speed is end to end. High performance organizations don't get trapped in the plan do cycle. They get good at doing plan do check act cycles, rapidly iterating what works and what doesn't. So I, lo I love showing this um, picture of Jeff Bezos laughing. Because in, this, is from, this is from 2011. Amazon were doing a software deployment once every 11.6 seconds. Yeah, I heard that. That's pretty quick. If you look at some of the data that's coming out of reInvent, reInvent is on next week, um, they're actually doing software deployments close to once every second now. So can you imagine how fast, how cheap, how quick it is to run experiments in that company and learn what works and what doesn't? Does anyone know what Jeff Bezos did before he started Amazon? He was an investment banker. Excellent. So Jeff has taken all these methods that are known and practiced for managing uncertainty in highly complex adaptive markets like the financial markets and using that to build small bets, two pizza teams to rapidly explore products and ideas to see what works and what doesn't. Get these cross-functional diverse teams connected to customer problems. Let them experiment, see if they can move the metrics. Let them own the problem, come up with options to solve how to get there. For all the people that are sitting in project world, this is basically what you're hearing. You've got business units, you're lucky you've got projects that are measured on throughput or how much velocity they're doing, and then they throw that over the wall to ops who are measured on stability. So when you're the leader in an organization, this is what you hear. Hey, we've got loads of new ideas. I need some money. Hey, we're working on projects. We need some money. Hey, guess what? Everything that's been built, it doesn't work. We need some money. So who knows where we should place a bet to fix all this? Any, any ideas in the audience? Anyone got the answer? When you're in a project world, you can't get there. 
when you're in a product world where teams are created to go after problems, if you figure out that the problem dies quickly, great, that's success, kill it. Give that team another problem to solve. This is why these organizations power ahead. So a lot of people ask me, this is really tough, how do I bring this to life? Uh, one of my clients is the New York Times. So they wanted to start to show what this looks like. Instead of working in project teams anymore, they wanted to show what cross-functional product teams look like. And we thought big and started small. We just get three teams, and we just kept giving them problems to solve. If you're ever looking uh, for people to volunteer problems, or what's wrong with your product, just go on to the opinion section of the New York Times. Lots of great feedback there about how they could improve their product. <laughs> but by acting your way to a new culture, by showing people what this starts to look like when you practice it, it's phenomenal. How you can rapidly kill. Success for us was actually killing ideas as quickly as possible. The measure for innovation is not how many ideas propagate through the system, it's actually how quickly you can kill ideas. It's counterintuitive. You should be optimizing to be wrong, not right, and rapidly trying to invalidate your idea. Because if you can't invalidate it, it's going to work. So other things I want you to think about is that it's not always just about the products inside your company. Often one of the great opportunities is starting to open up your ecosystem to companies outside, bringing more innovation into your company. Uh, another one of the exec teams I work with is International Airlines Group. They own British Airways, Iberian, Velling, a number of these airlines you might be familiar with. Now, one of the challenges we had is that this is an organization that's already packed up with loads and loads and loads of ideas internally about how they can innovate. But they know they need to do more. So if you had no people, no money, no time, and you knew that you were leaving opportunity on your portfolio and not going after it, what would you do? So what do you do on your projects when you have no time, no money, no people, no budgets? Innovate. innovate. Great. So how can you innovate? Well, what they realized is they had no budget. They had no time, they had no money, but they had all this amazing data. They had all these amazing assets that they didn't have the opportunity to exploit. So what did we do? We set up Hangar 51. This is the first ever venture capital firm in the airline industry, where British Airways opened up all their APIs, all their data, all their assets for startups to start building new products and services on top of their existing infrastructure. And as a result of getting access to all these assets, BA just took a small stake in the organization, took some equity in return for opportunity. This has been like transformational for the airline industry in terms of the innovation that happens. This is an example of one of the companies that's been through the pro program called Asaya. These are four people. They basically got a camera, started to monitor how long it took to airplanes to turn around at the terminal. Now, in the airline industry, you only make money when the plane is in the air. When it's on the ground, it's costing you money. So the quicker you can optimize that turnaround, the faster you can do it. This is literally a system that's already out in operation, recording when the bags arrive, when the foods arrive, have the passengers arrive. They're, they get feedback in seconds when one of those components is failing, which used to take minutes. And all the time, every single time a plane comes into the uh, port, they're learning. They're gathering new data. They're understanding how things work, what's the optimal time, how they can make it faster. This is what exponential technologies look like when you start to apply them to problems. And when you start to really innovate, we are thinking about what's possible to start building portfolios, partnerships to help you innovate. So these are just a couple of examples, hopefully, to encourage you to start thinking about, but what can you do to think big and start small and learn to maybe unlearn some of these things? Uh, the first thing I'd say to you is this. Go back to your teams, yourself, and really try to identify what's the strategic objective your team is owing to impact. Can you correlate that? If Paddy McCord stopped you in the hallway and asked you, what are you working on? Can you tell her what outcome you're trying to achieve and what you're trying to do to impact it? 
It's the best test in the world. Seriously, go ask your team that. Because if you have alignment, you're going to have amazing teams. Get a couple of people together. Map your portfolio. Try and understand what's actually happening in your organization and does it actually ladder up to the objectives that you're trying to get. You can do this in your team, even just looking at the features that you're building and the objectives that you're aiming for that you're trying to drive. Are they actually all making sense? And then the last bit is look at your metrics. Are you actually clear about what will tell you you're exploring stuff and you should keep doing it? Exploiting it, sustaining it, retiring it, or should you just kill it? Thanks for taking some photos. That's always a good feedback mechanism. People who actually think it's useful. So uh, I wrote a book on Unlearn. If you're interested in that, check it out. Eric Reed said it was good. <laughs> I also got a podcast. Uh, I interview lots of cool people who know way more stuff than me. It's the best personal development tool I've ever had. Really encourage you all to go start a podcast. You get to interview people like, oh, no, my God, that's Martin Erickson over there. <laughs> There's Gib Biddle, VP of product for Netflix. Katrina, she's the CDO for Finair. Melissa Perry, awesome product coach. There's lots of cool stuff that I love giving away for free. Go check it out. If you're interested in using that workbook, just sign up for the newsletter. Um, lovely to come to Sydney. Thank you very much for having me. I think it's been very right. I'll take a couple of questions. Um, how sustainable do you think, um, so there's those four things that you've had, but how sustainable do you think 90% going towards innovation versus the rest going towards sustaining and change? How sustainable do you think that is for an organization? Um, I, th I think um, the, the fundamental question to start asking first is, how does your business model operate? Right. So if, you're, if you are a company like Netflix and innovation is so important, both in terms of the content that you're creating, in terms of the shows, and also the, you're trying to optimize the cost and speed of delivery and quality of delivery to all these new locations around the world, that's a huge uh, competitive advantage for them, right? If the shows suck, nobody's going to retain. If you're sitting there and it's buff, 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 buffering all the time, uh, you're just going to quit, right? So I think them understanding like these sort of really important characteristic of what's important for their business model is key. And, and this is a really important quote like for all of uh, you great product managers out there. A great business model, or sorry, a good business model beats a great product every time. Right? So you could have the super awesome product, but if you don't have a great business model, it's only a matter of time until you get gobbled up and die. So I think I would really encourage you all to really start understanding how your business model works and how your product fits into that, and whether you're going to try and grow and scale it or get into adjacencies, or what's the sort of behaviors of your customers? Do so they constantly need new content, better quality of service, faster, cheaper? It's really, really important. So please consider those questions. Um, because I think that's what's going to not only make you an awesome uh, product manager, uh, one day you might be crazy enough to become a chief product officer, and then I wish you luck at that as well. Yep. Um, how do you retire a product? I think it's a very rare skill. Yeah. Um, yeah, how do you, how do you sort of like get by it to retire a product? Yeah, uh, it's a great question. So the question was how do you retire a product? And, and it's, like, it's, it's very telling, right, when we ask in the room how many people have retired a product, and there's two ladies up the front here. Do you want to share how you did it? Um, oh, it's a audience participation time. Um, I, I, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> right? So I think, but this is a great example, right? Like, when, you're, when you are truly data informed about how your business operates, if the metrics are telling you it's going in the wrong way, sometimes it, it often costs more to operate a, a product than it's actually returning. But somebody will always have an objection. And this is the point I really want you to think. Somebody will always say, but on there's one customer that's still using that. Or, no, we can't turn that off because uh, it's ran forever and nobody knows how it works. <laughs> Honestly, the amount of times I've gone into organizations and there's a, a piece of software 
running on a Nintendo 64 that is worth like seven billion dollars to a company. And people are afraid. You know, and, and this, is, <clears throat> this is the whole point. People fear letting go of things. What if? And again, it's one of these really important things about this strategy, about thinking big and starting small and learning fast. Like, could we turn it off for an hour? Could we turn it off for a day? Could we turn it off for a week? Because if it's really so important, we're going to get a phone call. And I think it's just giving people a strategy to explore uncertainty in a safe way is super, super key. So every time you've got to do something challenging like that, try and use that pattern. Like, be brave, start small, turn it off for a minute, what's going to happen? Turn it off for a month, a year, and we might never see it again. Use your metrics. Think about how usage of the systems. They're really, really important. Because the more bits of software that are living in your ecosystem, the harder it's going to be for you to innovate at speed. That's what it comes down to. Cool question. Cool. Thanks for having me. Alrighty. Now, I came up with, <clears throat> with an experiment in the last 11.6 seconds that I thought I'll just ship and follow the spirit. How many people have been here for the first time at Product Tank? Uh, okay, awesome. So we're going to run a quick NPS survey. Um, I thought the, the talks were really awesome. So if you're, uh, you know how this works. On a scale of 0 to 10, how likely are you to recommend Product Tank? If you're a 0 to 6, do nothing. If you're a 7 or 8, clap. And if you're a, a 9 or a 10, just give me a woo. <laughs> Excellent. That worked. Cool. Um, <laughs> so we're... Um, um, we're going to wrap this up. Um, quick action items, if you have any jobs, uh, email me. Um, yes, you can also add me on LinkedIn. Um, if you love free drinks and, uh, and, and want to cheer for female founders, come along tomorrow to the She Starts event at ACS. Um, and uh, if you want to hear more of these amazing talks, go to uh, Mind the Product in March in Singapore. And, uh, and last but not least, I just heard before the event that uh, this was our last product tank for this year, and uh, I'm going to take a break, and once, uh, once I'm out of a job, I'm going to think about what next year looks like. Uh, but we've got one more event that all the, like last year, all the product meetups across Sydney um, are going to put together uh, as, as sort of a, a group, which is on the, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, the 12th of December at Safety Culture. And we're going to put the uh, we're going to put the all the details live on the product tank page uh, in the next couple of days or something. So um, put those dates in your calendar. Otherwise, um, help yourselves to pizza. The first few months at Atlassian are always known as Fat Atlassian because there's so much food and sweets and soft drinks. So please uh, please help the engineers and the rest of the team from uh, uh, by by eating the pizza. Uh, otherwise, they have to have it for breakfast, which is terrible for them, isn't it? Um, <laughs> And uh, and uh, and enjoy yourselves, and we'll see you next year.